All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this workshop uh, on, on criminal justice reforms. The panel today will be featuring policy experts from Right on, right on Crime, uh, Chelsea Murphy, who's their Florida State Director, and Scott Murphy, who is their Louisiana State Director, along with the Deputy Director from the American Conservative Union, David Safey. Uh, from the public sector side, uh, we have two representatives from Pennsylvania, one being York County's District Attorney on Sunday, and Pennsylvania Representative Cheryl, Cheryl Delosier. So these panelists will be discussing today the intersection and relatedness between community corrections and clean slate policies. Uh, over the years, some states such as Pennsylvania, where Representative Delosier is, and Mr. David Sunday, and other states have addressed these issues and have certainly reaped the benefits. Before we kick off the session, I'd just like to walk through a few housekeeping tips uh, before the panel begins. If you'd like to ask any of the panelists questions during their presentation, uh, you'll be able to submit questions via the chat box or the Q&A box below. Um, you can find that, as I mentioned, at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be getting to all the questions at the end of their presentation. Uh, the chat box will also be used for handouts and policy resources that Right on Crime and American Conservative Union and also members of Alex staff have provided uh, to share to share all the resources um, and handouts during the presentation. Uh, we'll also be following up with everyone who's tuned in um, with the handouts mentioned. Uh, if you're interested in rewatching the workshop, uh, please note that we will be distributing uh, this video through Alec Connect uh, later this week, early next week, and we'll also be releasing it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash American Legislative. Uh, we can also follow up and send you the video um, when it's released as well. Now to kick off the panel, I'm going to pass it off to Chelsea Murphy, and she'll be giving some brief introductory remarks. Well, thank you so much for uh, having us all. And although I'm really sad that we're not all in person together in Orlando, um, I am still really thankful to see all your faces. So I figured I would just kind of kick it off very generic, very simple, and let everyone just um, answer. We can just kind of go around. But um, simple question, what is community corrections? Um, David, you want to kick off? Yeah. Um... So, you know, I think, I mean, Scott's the better person as the practitioner who's, who's worked in community corrections hands on, but the way I would view it is it's a way to hold people accountable when they make a mistake without having uh, to um, take away 100% of their liberty, without having to resort to prison or jail. And, and from the ACU perspective, you know, we think community corrections is such an important part of the criminal justice system, if only because it allows us to find that middle ground between incarceration and, and doing very little, you know, citation and notice. And so we see community corrections as, as a pretty important area, but it's one that we can also, uh, I think a lot of us can agree, requires a little bit of, little bit of reform and a little bit of fine tuning uh, to make sure that it's optimized to get the best results for the buck um, and not to be uh, overly punitive and, and underly punitive that makes sense. Absolutely. Scott, what about you? Thank you, Chelsea. Um, one, it's great to be on this panel um, with uh, Dave, uh, David, and uh, Representative Delosier. Uh, we actually copied some of your clean slate legislation and um, have started that here in Louisiana, so we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> would also like to um, recognize all the probation and parole officers. Uh, the American Probation and Parole Association has designated this week as uh, pre-trial probation and parole supervision week. Uh, their tagline is restoring trust and creating hope. And that's what community corrections or community supervision is all about, uh, is creating um, a, a sense of hope for those that are on probation and parole. Um, and probation and parole, uh, community supervision can take on many different forms. Uh, two of the most common forms of community supervision uh, would be probation and parole. And as David mentioned, uh, they provide for supervision for persons that are convicted of crimes uh, where they're able to remain in the community instead of going off to jail and being incarcerated. Uh, probation and parole officers, they have the responsibility to assist those persons that are on supervision uh, by making quality referrals throughout the community, using different resources that are available, uh, addressing mental health, substance abuse, vocational training, employment, 
uh, and making sure that the orders of the court, uh, the, the specialized conditions are adhered to uh, throughout the supervision. In short, uh, community corrections or community supervision is an alternative uh, to incarceration. As David mentioned, there's a lot of work that, that can be done um, to, to reform or to tweak it a little bit better. Uh, in Louisiana, for example, and I believe it's the same in most other states, probation and parole revocations drive almost one half of our prison admissions. Um, however, this number has been on decline uh, since, 20, since implementation of the 2017 reforms. So effective use of community corrections or community supervision is critical uh, to the success of the criminal justice reforms. And being a former probation and parole officer, um, I believe that the probation and parole officers are on the front lines. Um, they are the first people in most cases um, that a parolee will see in Louisiana, it's within 48 hours. Uh, probationers, it's one of their first interactions with community corrections or community supervision, and they hold the key to helping reduce recidivism um, in our prisons. Awesome. Um, Representative Delosier, just a few words on what you think uh, community, well, uh, what you know community corrections to, to look like. Sure, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Anytime that we can talk about what we're doing in Pennsylvania, uh, we're, we're glad to do that. And, and um, also, as, as was mentioned, we're also uh, not too proud to steal other ideas uh, as we talk to many across the, the different states. Uh, so when we hear something good, we, we also uh, look for other options. Uh, one of those options that we have in Pennsylvania and what we've been doing here and clean slate was mentioned. And, um, but the, right now dealing with this idea of probation and parole is, is the bill that we're working on. Um, we have uh, the Senate version, the House version, uh, but the, the primary purpose of it is to, to make sure that people are not um, in prison uh, when they don't necessarily have to be. And a lot of that comes back to the technical violations uh, that people have when they are required to comply with court orders, obviously when they are released. Um, and the ability for them to, to comply with that, um, but the ability also to recognize that small um, things that are keeping them from keeping a job um, and those types of things shouldn't necessarily be a reason for someone to go back to, to prison. So the ability for us to, to recognize that, um, you know, we can't necessarily have a meeting with probation and parole officers uh, when um, we, uh, during the day uh, when we work, um, we want them to be working. We want folks to um, make, the second chance that they have by get, when they have been released um, to, to very much uh, do what they need to do to keep their be with their families and to be in our communities and be taxpayers and and um, and and take full advantage of the of the second chance that they do have. So we work with Clean Slate to to give them a second chance when it comes to uh, one time offense, you know, ten years after. Um, and with probation and parole reforms, we're looking at technical violations and good time and and the ability to say that if you're you're following the rules, we want to try and, and work with and make sure that you can uh, um, not go back in because it's also not only is it a societal issue it's also a financial issue we don't um, we want people it costs money to keep people in prison um, and so we can get a good common sense balance uh, with making sure people are doing the right thing um, but also making sure that they're following the rules that, that were established by the court um, and make sure that um, they stay outside our prison system um, and reform um, as they need to be. Thank you so much. And someone with boots on the ground, especially um, District Attorney uh, David Sunday, what do you think about um, community corrections and what, what does that look like to you? Well, to start with, you know, I, I want to thank everyone for being here and, and for sponsoring this, this very important and timely discussion. Um, as, as an elected DA who's, you say, as you say, boots on the ground, uh, we in, in, in our profession are going through right now um, growing and adapting as a result of the world around us, not just what's going on societally, but also what's going on with regard to evidence and data. And I start that because in, the, in our discussions about criminal justice, there's a lot of different positions that are taken clearly. I mean, it's an emotional topic. It's an important topic. It has ramifications for people's lives um, in the DA's office, not just the lives of people that are charged with crimes, but their families their children, the victims, the victims' families. And so what we do has far-reaching ramifications for generations. 
And so what we are doing as, as prosecutors, as DAs, is we're really taking a step back. And this isn't something new. This is a natural progression in the way that we view our job to begin with. But we're looking to see what can we do better. And when I talk about better, I don't just mean um, longer prison sentences. I mean, what can we do to increase public safety, to decrease the impact on victims and their families and decrease the impact on defendants' families. Because it, and I think we're gonna hear this repeatedly through this conversation, but our community is vastly safer if we have families that are together, if we have people that are working, if they're gainfully employed, if they're low, if recidivism is going down. And so it's important throughout all of these conversations about criminal justice reform that we tie it. And I know that Representative Delosier understands this. I know that a lot of our um, representatives in Pennsylvania do, but it has to be tied to community safety. And all of these things we're discussing today, like treatment courts, um, which are now called wellness courts, by the way, at least in Pennsylvania they are. So wellness courts, um, pretrial diversion, um, early termination of parole and probation, everything we're doing in York County with a reentry coalition to try to get people jobs, this is all geared towards keeping the community safer. And also, um, and, and a lot of people don't realize this, and I'm hoping that, that this will develop over time, but it saves a tremendous amount of money. When you have someone who's not, um, who, who's not committing additional crimes, who's working, um, you have less people in prison, and in York County alone, our, our wellness courts for the last full year that we have data for save taxpayers close to $2 million. And that's through reduced prison days, again, through, um, through all of the opportunity costs of someone uh, working and providing an income for their family and so on. I could go on for hours about this, but I won't. So uh, that's my introduction. And I look forward to a really um, thoughtful discussion about this topic. So hey, hey, can, I, can I key in off of something uh, District Attorney Sunday, Sunday said? I, I think there, there are two things, particularly for the ALEC audience, right? The first is, um, you know, post-COVID, I think every jurisdiction is looking for cost savings, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, to the extent that we can make community corrections more efficient uh, and, and use it one, partly as an alternative to full-blown incarceration, um, I think that makes sense. But we, I think everybody knows that no constituent uh, it comes into a, a, a legislator's office and says, "Damn it, I want to pay. Uh, I want to pay less money, even though it's going to make my family less safe." Right? Everything has to be tied to public safety, and so you know, people like Representative Delosier and, and her legislation goes right to that point, because um, in reforming probation and parole and reforming the criminal justice system, we can find the right balance to cut down on incarceration, but also to cut down on recidivism. And that's, that's something that, Dave, I think you alluded to here. Every case of recidivism, I think, other than technical violations, really results in, you know, it's not just a new case, but it's a new crime. It's a new victim. It's a new prison cell. So those are the drivers of, incar of a lot of our incarceration. What we can do to prepare people um, to stay on the straight and narrow is the, is the easiest way to save money. And, and so to the extent that we can, we can use community corrections as a way to, you know, make sure that people are doing the right thing and they're not going on and having a second or a third encounter with the law, that's a win-win for everybody. And, and the final thing I would say is one key part of community corrections I think we often under, underlook or uh, overlook is that it allows parents to stay with their families oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important part when, um, you know, that parental connection, that family connection, not only further helps keep people on the straight and narrow, but it also has an impact on whether children down the road have an encounter with the criminal justice system. So we're kind of, by if we do this right, we break that intergenerational cycle of poverty and crime. So, you know, it's, this is not an unimportant topic. No, absolutely. And I think that with that being said, obviously, you know, we know that prisons cost taxpayers a lot of money. Um, yet they don't always provide the best outcomes. Um, you know, we're, we're currently having recidivism rates ranging from 25 to 65 percent 
after only five years. Um, and, and with that being said, Scott, as a former sheriff, probation officer, um, you know, can community corrections take us down another path, um, one that provides, you know, cost efficient savings, and then as well as, you know, like we've been mentioning, has to keep our community safer. What, what are those types? What are those alternatives? Well, I'll give you the short answer real quick. Yes. Um, and then I'll bore <laughs> you with some stats. Um, here in Louisiana, uh, we have over 32,000 people um, in our Department of Corrections and in our prisons throughout the state. Uh, as many are probably aware, Louisiana and Oklahoma go back and forth as the number one incarcerator in the nation. Uh, and I think David alluded to it. Um, in 2017, when, when we started reforms in Louisiana, uh, the goal was not to simply open the doors and let everyone out. Um, the goal was to address what's making people come back into prison. Uh, what we do is we release over 16,000 people back into society each year. Unfortunately, after five years, 43% of those persons return back to prison. Uh, if 43% of our bridges collapsed each year, or if only 57% of our school children graduated, we would certainly consider this a crisis and immediate action would have to be taken. Uh, we are not getting a good return on our taxpayer dollars that are being spent on incarceration. Uh, there are certain people that belong in, in jail and there are others that, that can be effectively and safely um, and cost effectively supervised in the community. Uh, in Louisiana, our DOC budget is $500 million a year. Um, if we use community supervision appropriately or correctly, it will provide the opportunity to one, hold someone accountable for their actions, but allowing them to remain in the community to address the issues that cause them to interact with the criminal justice system uh, in the first place. Uh, I've checked, there's several different numbers out there, but the estimated cost to incarcerate an individual in Louisiana on the low end is $16,000 a year. Uh, there was a VERA report that said the average cost nationally is $31,000. Uh, our budget, as I mentioned, is, is over $500 million each year, but $70 million of that $500 million goes to community supervision. So our population of probation and parolees is 58,000 people here in Louisiana. If you do the math, that's about $1,200 a person to be supervised on probation and parole in the community, as opposed to over $16,000 a person uh, that, that is incarcerated. So community corrections certainly can provide an alternative to incarceration that provides a greater return on our taxpayer dollars while keeping our communities safe. And as everyone mentioned, keeping families together, returning people to be productive citizens and recognizing that you know, we do believe in second chances and, and as the tagline for the American Probation and Parole Association is developing trust and, and, and instilling hope uh, for people. And you guys just recently passed some probation reforms in Louisiana, correct? We did. Um, starting back in 2017, uh, Louisiana passed sweeping bipartisan criminal justice reform uh, with our Justice Reinvestment Initiative. And it was, it was a package of 10 bills. One of the four goals of that reform package was to strengthen community supervision. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we could have opened the doors and let everyone out, but I believe we recognized the, the recidivism issue and addressing recidivism by having good reentry programs and helping those people that are on the front lines in community supervision is gonna be critical to lowering that 43% number. Uh, some of the, the reforms that, that happened in 2017 is we took the maximum five years uh, of a probation sentence for someone with a nonviolent offense and reduced it to three years. Uh, I was actually working as a probation and parole officer on November 1st, 2017, when those reforms went into place. Uh, I can tell you, we didn't sleep well Halloween night um, because they told us we wouldn't have vacations and you know we were gonna have all this extra work to do. Uh, turns out in, in, in the long run, um, it, it made things a lot more efficient. Uh, what we also did was implemented earned compliance credits. And what that does, let's say someone gets a three-year probated sentence, that sentence is automatically dropped down to 18 months. And if a person commits a violation during a month, that month is extended. So if they commit a violation the first month of probation, then they have 19 months to serve. And then it continues as they continue with, uh, with violations. And these are for low-level 
technical violations that I think Representative Delosier mentioned, uh, a way of addressing those without returning someone back to prison, without using a jail sanction. Uh, a lot of times we, we could use a two to three day jail sanction, but that would cause somebody to lose their job uh, or, or miss something going on with their family. Um, we also worked on fees and fines, um, trying to make it based on their ability to pay. Unfortunately, um, that was a huge can of worms. Uh, we're still working here in 2020 on the fees and fines portion. It keeps getting delayed because we, we need to figure out a way to adequately and appropriately fund our courts without doing it on the backs of the people uh, that are in the system. Uh, we also made changes to, yes? No, that's, you keep going. Listen, we all want all of these great, that's, that's wonderful. I think I was just gonna actually just double check to see if, if Rep Delusier, you know, obviously, while we have you here, um, you are clearly a champion for probation reform. How did you get involved? Um, and can you talk a little bit about um, 1555 and, and what that all entails? Sure. No, no. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with what was being said as to the fact that we need to take a look and, and review some of the um, what is on the books. Um, and, and some of those um, changes are a little more difficult um, than others. Uh, and uh, fees and fines certainly is, is an issue. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we went about changing that with Clean Slate a little bit. Um, and we worked very closely with the DA's in our state and the DA's association as there are, from my perspective, they're one of my sounding boards as to um, what does work within the system. Um, and with the probation bill that you mentioned, um, we also, you know, we're talking to our probation officers that, that are there every day um, doing the job. But um, to, to kind of just kind of take a step back for Pennsylvania's side of it, um, what we ended up doing a number of years ago, probably, it keeps getting longer, obviously, uh, probably closer to now five years ago, um, we all uh, had a conversation about what changes we could make here in Pennsylvania. And um, that was when uh, we had four individuals, two from the Senate and two from the House, uh, that uh, decided to, to try and be proactive with the changes for uh, criminal justice reform. And that's where the Clean Slate Bill started. Started, um, which I always kind of tell the story a little bit about the fact that we had um, two very um, uh, conservative Republicans, myself and, and Senator Wagner here in central Pennsylvania. And then we had two um, uh, very avid Democrats uh, from Philadelphia uh, in the Senate and the House. Um, and if you compared our voting records in, in, in just about probably anything else, then they would never have agreed. Um, and so I bring that up simply because um, while we didn't agree on many, many other issues because our districts are very different and, and so obviously our advocacy is different on, uh, for our, our constituents, um, we could agree on, on criminal justice reform and we could agree that there needed to be a change and we could agree that um, this was about people. Um, it wasn't about politics. It was about the fact that, um, as was mentioned, with recidivism, uh, with being with your families, uh, with, with breaking the cycle, as, as uh, Sunday said, um, the ability for us to uh, be able to talk about um, the, the effects of our community uh, with any of these bills, whether we talk about the uh, probation bill or we talk about clean slate or we talk about the licensure bill that we just, the governor just signed here in Pennsylvania as well. Um, all of the numbers that we just, or, or issues that you just mentioned are part of that, that all of those bills. Um, and, you know, we had licensure reform uh, that, that a part of Pennsylvania law that says that, and that's for jobs, that's for getting people back into a working, good paying job here in Pennsylvania. And if you had a, a, um, a an offense of shoplifting, uh, what does, how does that stop you from being a cosmetologist? How does that stop you from, um, uh, from doing many of the jobs that are out there um, that require state licensure? Um, and in, in Pennsylvania, at least, um, the ability for us to say, if you had one offense, um, you could be turned down from a state license simply because of the offense. Not that it had anything to do with what it was that you were trying to do and get a job, um, but that it had, um, that you ha were a uh, felon of some sort um, and had a background in, in uh, having served time. So the ability for us to take a look at clean slate and say you go 10 years and you had one offense, uh, you're clean slated and we, we uh, clean slate your, your offense. It's still on the record. It's not expungement. It is still on the record. Um, but um, the ability for you to have that second chance that it's not public record. Um, and then you, we move forward with the licensure and say, you know, you, your jobs and you getting a job within um, 
uh, the state uh, is important. And, and there's no reason why just because you have a, a background um, and have served time, you're, you're trying to reform yourself. You're trying to be a real estate agent. You're trying to be um, a, a cosmetologist, at which, which ironically enough, we teach in prison. <laughs> so the fact that we teach barbering skills and cosmetology skills of cutting hair in our, our women's prisons and in, in, in our, um, our men's prisons, and, and then they come out and there's a morals clause and they're not allowed to have a license. So that in and of itself is government needs to get out of the way. And, and I think that's the theme of a lot of these bills is um, many times we talk about that we don't want people to go back into prison. We don't want people to um, uh, not take advantage of the second chance government consistently stands in the way of doing that. And, and I think that um, that is what the conversations have been with the drug courts, with recognizing um, that we can take different steps um, and we can make clean slate and we can give them a second chance and we can make sure that the state is not in the way of getting a state license. And, and then again, with a probation and parole reform, um, that, that a small technical, technical offense um, doesn't send somebody back and, and as was mentioned lose their job that they worked hard probably to get um, and so get somebody to give them a second chance uh, because of, of the having a record um, but the ability for them you know like you said three days they could lose a job in that three days never mind a couple weeks um, as well as the facts so I think all of these phases are are things that within criminal justice we can make sure the victims are heard in the process Victim advocacy has been one of my passions and one of the issues, and that's probably why originally they came to me to, to talk about it, was because I was so adamant about victims' rights in, in our system. Um, and, you know, we fought for Marcy's Law here in Pennsylvania, and we're still fighting for that, um, to make sure that the victims have the right to be heard in our criminal justice system. So what I'm saying is that for me, as an advocate for victims, we can have a common sense balance. We can make sure that victims' voices are heard, um, and we can make sure that those that serve their time and have done what the courts have asked them, they made a mistake, they, they paid for it, let's move on. Let, let's, let's try to have government get out of the way. Um, so those are kind of the different bills that we've been working on, um, and, and, and two are in law. Um, oh, and, and with fines and, fines and fees, I just wanted to mention uh, another bill that I have working over in the Senate right now is, is um, House Bill 440. Um, but what we are working with that is, is the fines and fees issue was when we were working with Clean Slate, we recognized that a lot of those, um, because the original bill that we had put through said that if you had fines and fees outstanding or restitution outstanding, you were not eligible for Clean Slate in Pennsylvania. Um, and so we have uh, modified that to say restitution, and, and this comes back to my advocacy for victims, restitution has to be paid. Um, you committed a crime, you did something to someone, and there is that victim, um, and that victim needs to be made whole. Um, but your fines and fees, uh, we are allowing them to be eligible for Clean Slate, um, and they can pay their fines and fees back once they have that job that they may not have been able to get um, with uh, having the record on, as public. Um, so we're trying to find, again, that, that balance and that happy medium um, to, to recognize that people need to have a job in order to pay fines and fees. Um, and so we, we're trying to balance that uh, with these, at least these three pieces of legislation and hopefully 440 will go through as well uh, to allow for people to, to get that job in order to pay their fines and fees. So that, that's kind of a 20,000 foot look at some of the things. That's so important and now more than ever um, and everything going on with the stay and age. But um, with that, um, District Attorney Sunday, you are known for your innovative um, ways that you've been handling ex-offenders and getting them, you know, back help into the community. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing now and how that connects with uh, community supervision? Sure. And and just before I jump into that real quick, a comment about um, Representative Delosier and some of the statements she made. I know there's the, the, the audience for, for this, primarily state legislators, and uh, at least that I know of. And so um, I think it's important for people to acknowledge the fact that it takes a tremendous amount of courage to tackle these issues. And one of the reasons I say that is because in, so in the criminal justice system, when a criminal file um, lands on my desk, right? So when it lands on my desk and it, and someone's been charged with a crime, we'll say a drug crime. Okay. We, We'll say we have uh, someone in their midlife, it's their third or fourth drug crime, drug offense, um, or even a, let's say it's a younger person who commits a violent offense. That's a lagging indicator of societal issues. And so 
when we get that that case, what 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 I'm doing now as a prosecutor and what most of my colleagues across the country are doing is digging into that case and moving sort of forward in it, right? Because, you know, we can't, we are so inundated with cases. So I have around 10,000 cases a year in the York County DA's office. We have 35 prosecutors. If you do the math, that's not good. And so what, so although some of us are brought to this um, because we have a, an, an innate desire to do good for the community, and to keep people safe and healthy. Other people, just by pure nature of survival in their office, have to do it differently. And so with all that being said, um, to make a correction or a change legislatively in the way we handle criminal justice is something that you're not gonna get an instant response on. Okay, there's no instant gratification on the fight that Representative Delosier has, has taken nor is there instant gratification on advocacy from the part of prosecutors. It, it'll take generations to see the rewards of this. And so I only say that and I put, it, put that out there because most DAs that you will ever come in contact with, regardless of their political affiliation, understand the, how critical it is to keep people from committing crimes in the first place. And so as a, as a legislator, I would, I would say to you, reach out to your DAs, have these conversations and have the courage to do this because even though you may not, and, and I see um, Cheryl kind of laughing when I said that, but you know, <laughs> even though you're not going to have a million people reach out to you and say, thank you at the moment, you are setting a course for, for a better society, for safer, a safer life for our children. And, and so I applaud the legislators that have the courage to go and do this. And I just felt it was important for me to get that in real quick before we turn to the next issue. Um, talking about reentry, why is reentry important? Along the lines of what I just discussed, you know, when you're in law school, uh, for those on the panel that have attended law school, no one teaches you about um, childhood trauma. No one teaches you about addiction, the disease of addiction, about untreated mental health disorders and how that impacts your community. These are things that I have learned on the job. And another thing that I've learned on the job is that our community is safer when people have jobs. And so with that in mind, we made it a priority in this office to not only be a passive participant in a reentry coalition, but to be an active member in the leadership of that. And so my first assistant district attorney is the co-chair of the York County Reentry Coalition. Through that, that has allowed us to build relationships with the York County Economic Alliance, with tons of private businesses to, to find people that are willing to give second chances to offenders. Um, I worked at UPS for eight years, and that's an odd part of my background. Um, but that being said, you know, some of the best employees that we had were people who were on work release, that were on parole and probation, um, that were fighting tooth and nail to make something out of their lives. And, and, and so our goal is to educate the community businesses on why it's critical to do that. The other thing that I've learned through this process of reentry um, is that through the reentry process is I had no idea the barriers to success for someone who gets out of prison. I mean, I had no clue. And, and now I really understand it. Everything from how you actually get home from the prison mm -hmm. to having an ID because to apply for a job, you have to have some form of ID. Um, and, and so the hurdles in front of you are not insurmountable, but they are without question, extremely difficult. And so as a prosecutor, I want less files coming into my office. Our community is safer when less people are committing crimes. And so just by way of introduction to this topic, um, we are an active participant in, in the whole concept of reentry. Uh, we work on developing um, tools that reentrants can utilize to get jobs. We help um, be advocates for the whole process of reentry with regard to uh, getting IDs. Um, we have volunteer outreach with our prison ministries. Uh, we work on housing. Everyone knows there's a housing crisis in this country. And so um, we have collaborated with partners to identify housing assistance. And this may sound odd coming from, I mean, your county is a very Republican county. But when you dig into the data, it makes sense and it makes it safer for everyone. Um, and so, you know, 
Transportation is a whole nother issue. Uh, we worked very hard on transportation. We uh, entered into an MOU um, with PennDOT that streamlines license and ID, the license and ID replacement process. And so those are just a few things that we're working on right now um, through the DA's office on this topic. Wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for your work and, and, and what you guys are doing because it's so crucial um, to, to make sure that we're getting, I mean, otherwise it's a, a waste of the, the money that we've been using to, to, to put these folks behind and, and give them corrections if they're not going to come back out and be successful in society. I mean, and, and real quick, if I may, Scott Payton hit it on the head earlier. I mean, there are people that absolutely need to go to jail. And sure. we have a part of my office that whose sole purpose in this world is to go to trial and convict people in front of a court of law and advocate for life sentences if that's appropriate. And, and that's something that we can't forget in all the discussions we're having. Um, but the number of those cases are few and far between. Of the 10,000 cases a year, well, we'll say of the 8,000 adult criminal cases, uh, we may have around 90 criminal jury trials on average each year. And you know we're looking at homicides, attempted homicides, rape cases, um, cases involving child victims, and those people need to go away. However, like I said, you know, everything, you can't view each case in a vacuum. You have to view it in light of all the surrounding circumstances, and our system would break if we did not have the understanding and wherewithal to divert people from the process. It just wouldn't work. It's not, it's not a realistic outcome. I wish Mark was on here for a second, so I otherwise I'll steal his line. Uh, prison is for a place for people that we're mad at, not afraid of. Um, and I, I think that, or actually, I said that the other way: afraid at, not mad. At. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, there we go. So, hey, it's still a little, little, little hard for me on Tuesday. But, anyways, <laughs> with that being said, I, I, well, David, you got something? Yeah, I would just, I would, I would plug something that I think ties a lot of this together, and that is, you know. Uh, you know, Scott laid out that 43% recidivism rate in Louisiana, um, you know, only a government program can fail 43% of the time and go on and change. So what we talk about in community corrections and in reentry, what, you know, David is, is really a pioneer at, um, and then at Clean Slate is really a continuum of how we handle people who run afoul of the rules. In the beginning, we have, you know, care, custody, and control uh, with probation in, in the system or parole uh, agents keeping an eye on people. And, you know, I would point out parenthetically, you know, a lot of folks think, well, they just got off. They just got, they just got probation. It's no big deal. Being on community supervision is not easy. I've been on community supervision. It's no fun. You're checking in every day. You got, it, it, it becomes very hard to hold a job when, you know, you can have somebody come visit you and walk around and, say, well, do you know so-and-so has been convicted of a crime? It, it becomes very disruptive to the workplace. And employers, that's why employers support, um, you know, finding ways to do community supervision better. Um, but so you go from community supervision, then you go to reentry and how we can help people come out and get back on that path without the constraints of community supervision largely. But then we move to clean slate, right? And, and that is, and, it, and I think um, uh, either Dave or Cheryl mentioned this, you know, the best way to stay on the straight and narrow is to have a meaningful job. You know, we're not talking about baristas here, no offense to baristas, but coming out and finding good, good work that pays a good wage for, you know, um, a lot of people that have made mistakes. And that's where the clean slate portion at the end of that, that continuum really kicks in because, you know, the, the data is really so illustrative. If you have a criminal conviction, it doesn't matter what it is, you're 40% likely to get an interview for a job. Right, and that was before the economy kind of tanked because of COVID. And then, if you get the interview, and you know, by some miracle, you actually land the job, your salary is on on average thirty percent less than someone that doesn't have a conviction. So, you know, the clean slate portion yeah, is so important on the back end. And what I would I would throw out there um, is a lot of people hear clean slate. You know, my family. I, they saw me tweet something about clean slate and, and one of the closest people I am said, well, I can't support this. I'm an, I'm an employer. I need to know what we're talking about. What we're talking about are largely nonviolent offenders who have kept their nose clean for seven to 10 years, depending on the jurisdiction, right? For, for nonviolent, non-sexual crimes. 
you know, if you've kept your nose clean for seven years, the likelihood that you're going to go back out and reoffend is about this much. But, um, you know, it's the existence of that, that um, record that oftentimes becomes a, 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 a barrier to good, meaningful work. And that's why the clean slate portion is so important to this kind of list of things that we do for offenders. And, and there's a, um, there, there's a, I'm going to say a myth that I want to sort of bust here. And that is that community supervision and things like, for example, wellness courts, treatment courts, wellness courts, the same thing is that it's easy. Um, I will tell you right now that I have had many, many defendants over the years prefer to sit in a prison cell versus go through these processes because we, we also refer to them as accountability courts. Okay, you have to show up. You have deadlines that you have to meet. You have to follow through with things that you say. You have to go in front of a judge once a week. And if you do not do all this successfully, you get kicked out. And the accountability part of this is so critical because you are not just making people, you're not providing um, punishment for the crime because you are, but at the same time, you're giving someone tools they need to be a successful part of the community. And that can be very, very hard. And so as you're in the community and you talk to people that ask questions such as, well, aren't you just giving them, I mean, aren't they getting a break? The answer is no, they're not. They're getting a, an opportunity to succeed based on work. And, uh, and in some ways, this is an opportunity that no one has ever given them before. And I, I think it's critical to understand that as, as these conversations progress. Absolutely. And, and, and um, if I could add just real quick, I'm sorry. Um, it, I agree wholeheartedly with, with Dave. The ability for us, the, the, uh, the treatment courts or the wellness courts, um, I, I've made it a point to go down to uh, Cumberland County uh, Court, and that's run by uh, Judge Masland in, in Cumberland County. And um, the ability for us to watch these folks graduate um, and what they had to go through. And, and the mm -hmm. probation officer that's there, um, is, is she's, she's tough as nails and I would never want to be supervised by her by any stretch of the imagination um, because she does her job fantastic and, and she, but what she's trying to do is prove to these folks that A, number one, somebody believes in them and B, um, there's a better life outside of prison and there's a better life outside of addiction, which is another huge issue that goes into a lot of the criminal cases as to the fact of addiction to drugs or addiction to alcohol being obviously the two um, main ones. But the ability for us to get over that addiction and to work with them with these treatment courts and, and, and uh, uh, the ability to basically say, I'm going to stand behind you and I'm going to, you're going to, if you fall, I'll be behind you, but we're going to try and get through this to keep you out of prison. And the, the, at the graduations, which is where I would go, at the graduations to hear the stories that these folks, A, went through, um, but, but more importantly, honestly, in every single case, there's always somebody that they, themselves, obviously, but somebody that they did it for, in the sense of they got clean because of their child. They got clean because of their, their significant other. They got clean because of their mother. Um, whatever the case may be, each and every time that those faces that were in the audience that were so proud of them for, for getting through all of this hard work, um, and, and it wasn't always, you know, obviously easy. I mean, they fell off the wagon. They did, they, you know, certain things happen. Um, and, and I was there one time when Judge Madeline read them the riot act because they had made a bad decision um, and literally put them in like, like the dog house, like literally in the courtroom, they put him over, you know, um, because not to be moving on in the program at that point because of the mistake that he had made. Um, so it, the, the drug courts are very, very important and, and, and the treatment courts and, and all of them, I think work very, very hard to allow people to have that second chance and recognize that there are people that will stand behind them. Chelsea, if I could just add in, um, Dave, I, I've stood at revocation hearings and, and had people make the choice to go back to prison instead of going to what we call a drug court or specialty court. Um, one, of the, one of the critiques of, of the Justice Reinvestment Initiative here in Louisiana, some of the critics said that with these reforms, people would make that choice and not go into our specialty courts. And over the last three years, our specialty courts have remained uh, with, with the same number of people going through. Those that graduate from our drug courts here in Louisiana the recidivism is in the single digits. 
Mm -hmm. um, they are very, very tough programs. Uh, like you said, you go before the judge once a week. Um, there are consequences. And we used to have a saying in probation and pro, you're hard, but you're fair. And people realize that. Uh, and those that made that decision not to go to drug court and go to prison, they weren't ready for drug court. One of the, the, the things about drug court is that it's, it, there are so many levels of review and that when people get into those courts, they are ready to make a change and they're ready to, to follow those strict rules and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. David, um, I believe that you're on the Clean Advisory or Clean Slate Advisory uh, Board. Can you talk about that, your initiatives, what you guys are working on? Yeah, um, uh, the Clean Slate Initiative is a nationwide campaign to uh, tighten up, improve, expand expungement uh, for folks that have proven their worth, proven that they're in, they are worthy of a clean slate. And it really fits into our view at ACU that almost every person is capable of redemption and almost every person is entitled to a second chance. Um, so the, the, you know, framework for clean slate really is, again, you keep your nose clean, you're in a category of, of crimes that um, the legislature is deemed worthy or eligible for expungement. And then after a certain period of time, your, your record is automatically sealed. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to go and apply for a job or apply for an apartment or apply to go back to school. And if it says, have you ever been convicted of a crime, you can rightfully say no. Now, the file is still open to law enforcement. It's still open to many of the regulators. That's important. Um, but for the average person, you know, the average employer, they don't need to know whether or not you got nicked for an ounce of pot 10, 20 years ago. It has no bearing on your ability to perform a job. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take away those barriers to meaningful participation in society. And meaningful participation means good paying jobs. And you know, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm proud of the work we do. Um, I, I sit on the, on the board, the advisory board for the Clean Slate Initiative with uh, some really great colleagues, and and we're making progress all across the country. I mean, Scott carried so much water down in Louisiana, and we started the process there. We're we're um, on the verge of uh, well, we had we had a win in North Carolina to lay the foundation for it. Michigan, we're on the verge of it. We're bringing it all across the country. It's been enacted in Utah, but really the the credit for Clean Slate goes to Cheryl Delosier, right? She moved the bill in Pennsylvania before anybody was talking about clean slate. And, and you know, it, when, I, when I go into a state, I say, well, you know, look at Pennsylvania, look at Utah. Neither of those are really, you know, soft on crime states and they've, <laughs> they've adopted clean slate. And I think the number I saw, Cheryl, was that 30 million records have been sealed since you guys passed the bill. 30 million second chances for people in Pennsylvania. It's, it's mind blowing. And I think it is consistent with um, uh, you know, certainly where conservatives are that, you know, you, we hold people accountable and responsible for their activity, but eventually people are entitled to put it behind them and get a new start. And, and I think that, you know, to the average person, particularly people of faith, but, you know, the average person that looks at the system and goes, why are we holding people? And why, why are we, why are we, um, you know, penalizing people years, decades after they've made a mistake. Uh, at what point do we say, you know what, enough is enough. And so that's why um, I was so excited to, to see Representative Delosier on here. It's, it's a really key um, part of the criminal justice reform movement. I think it's the cutting edge. It's where the rest of the country is going and eventually it's gonna be a federal, federal bill as well. And you know, Pennsylvania, I don't know what it is about Pennsylvania, right? But we have a federal bill um, that's pending that Guy Reichenthaler has introduced you know, a federal a U.S. congressman. So they're, you know, you guys are on the cutting edge and I'm, I'm so, so proud to be associated with you even in this small way um, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But Cheryl, you know, I think, I think the work that you did was, you know, you were cool before it was cool. Um, <laughs> it, it's, something, it's something that I think everybody at Alex should be thinking about going, how can we do this to get more people back in the workforce? Seriously, thank you so much. And actually, I, um, I think Josh said that we've got a couple questions. So I want to make sure we leave some time for that. Um, 
Josh, do you want to yep. pop on? Yeah, so we have a few questions and I'll start with one from South Dakota State Senator Jim Stalzer. So in 2013, South Dakota passed legislation. It featured, um, the one of the main features was the presumption of probation. Uh, since that time, the Attorney General and law, law enforcement have told uh, him and his colleagues that this makes it very difficult to get to drug users to give up their dealer and ask that we repeal this provision and at least give them a tool to try to encourage cooperation. Uh, what has been exp the experience of some of the panelists today uh, on here? Oh, that's Sunday. I was just going to say, give it to the lawyer. <laughs> well, to start with, what I can say is, you know, the, the work of law enforcement with regard to um, drug addiction, drug trafficking, and I said drug addiction and drug trafficking because you can't separate the two, obviously, um, can be very difficult. And the reality, and this isn't a state secret, uh, the reality is that law enforcement utilizes individuals that are willing to provide information um, to work up the chain and identify larger dealers. I mean, you can learn that from watching Netflix, right? And so you have to have that opportunity available. And, and it sounds to me, and I'm not familiar with the actual statute, and I don't want to speak on the legality of the statute um, in South Dakota. However, uh, when you take away the stick part of the toolbox for a police officer who's trying to identify larger dealers, then that does call, cause a tremendous amount of problems. I mean, the reality is, and I don't want to, I know if we go down a discussion on drug addiction, that'll take up a whole nother day. And, I, and, and that's a topic near and dear to my heart, that the vast majority of drug dealers are drug addicts. And with that being said, similar to what we talked about with people that need to be incarcerated or not, there are people that need to go to jail that are drug dealers that are filling their communities with drugs, opioids, methamphetamine, that's killing people every day. And to get to those people, you do need people that are willing to cooperate. Um, and so all I can say is that I think that things would be very difficult if every person arrested for a drug crime knew that they had a presumption of probation uh, prior to sort of going down that path. So that's my, my limited response to that question. So I'm going to take the contra view. Uh, in fact, um, uh, you know, Justin, who submitted the question, um, we actually weighed in opposing that provision. Um, and here's why. At the end of the day, if you were a drug user, you're an addict, there's limited amount of information that you can turn over. I mean, you're out buying, buying the drugs for your own use, right? And to repeal the presumption of probation or to make it contingent upon giving up some useful information creates an exception that swallows the rule. And the, you know, the exception basically means that we have more low level drug dealer or drug users um, who, you know, at the end of the day, more of them end up in, in prison cells. I understand the concept of leverage. I think there are other ways in which law enforcement can apply that, that leverage. Look, there are 25 different ways you can charge somebody for a single crime, right? We all know that. Um, so, you know, kind of undermining that, that presumption of probation, one, it doesn't mean that probation is automatic, but it does create that, that leaning into that, that space. I, I think that we create more harm by locking up more people that are no longer public, that are not public safety threats, that are just casual drug users if we get rid of that, that language. And I think ultimately it means the taxpayers of South Dakota or wherever have to pay more to incarcerate more people that are not public safety threats. And that's just not helpful for anybody. And, and I mean, for I certainly appreciate that position and it's important to understand that, so for example, here, um, you know, we have a lot of pretrial, like, so when we have a lot in place here for people that are going through the throes of addiction, um, I think that there is a reality on the ground that exists um, in that it, it is very difficult in, and you have to understand for, so for example, I'm speaking to this from the perspective of someone whose county has been decimated by opioid addiction. 
Okay, and so drug dealing regarding opioid opioids is vastly different than drug dealing regarding methamphetamine and things of that nature. And I say that because the I'm going to say the logistical the logistical realities of how drug dealers operate with those drugs are vastly different. And so for us, the vast majority of drug dealers are users, and and our goal is to get those people into treatment. Um, but with that being said, and without looking at the specific verbiage of the law. Um, you know, I'm just sort of talking off the cuff here and you, you just police have to have the ability, regardless of what that is, to get someone to to want to cooperate. And and that's just from my personal experience and uh, also coming from a prosecutor who formed a nonprofit, the York Opioid Collaborative, to help funnel resources to people to get them into treatment. There is a place for um, law enforcement necessities. So but I'm always willing to learn. Josh, we got any other questions? Uh, that is it right now, actually. Awesome. Anybody else have any thing we might've left out? I know that, um, and actually I know we, we briefly touched on it, um, but Rep Delosier, can you just, just before we leave, just since you were, you know, you were the, the pioneer for the clean slate in Pennsylvania, um, just kind of talk about, you know, where you guys are at, how, what you're seeing success wise, um, and, and is it helping? I'm sure. That's yeah, yes. Absolutely. Um, for, with the clean slate, uh, we just had the one year anniversary. And as was mentioned, uh, millions and millions of records have been, um, clean slated, uh, to use the, the official term, uh, not expunged. And so I also want to stress that as, as some people, um, you know, uh, confuse the two. Um, but the ability for us to seal the record uh, from public view was, was very, very important. Um, some of the, uh, what I'll uh, bring up is, is some of the issues that came with that. I, I talked about the fines and the fees and, and being that, that being prohibitive. Um, and we're trying to fix that. Uh, but the other, the other side of it was also, um, you know, the ability for us to go retroactive, you know, and, and people say, oh, well, we should have gone back and everybody should have a new case. Um, and, and that's, that's, you know, where we need to find that balance again as to the fact that do we cannot by our constitution go and re, you know, and, and go back in. Um, and uh, uh, Dave Sunday can talk uh, more appropriately, I'm sure, uh, uh, about the, uh, the ability for them to go back into the court system for every single case and resentence somebody. Um, they can always ask for that resentencing. Obviously, the person can come into the court and ask for um, a resentencing. But the issue that goes along with that is, is the retro. Um, and for those that are now serving a particular, we went to three and five in our bill if it would uh, go into, I'm sorry, with, that's the probation side of it, but with the clean slate and the ability to um, make sure that those that um, are eligible are actually being done. Because one of the issues that did come up um, when we were doing the clean slate bill uh, was the issue of those that have um, cases that they were basically what happened was they were arrested and, and charged um, and maybe not even charged, you know, it depends on where they were in the system, but they were arrested for a certain uh, type of offense. Um, but that effect, and they could have been found uh, not guilty or just the cases could have been dropped. Um, but that filing of that case was, is still in, was still in the system. Uh, and so the ability for folks, you know, even if they went for a job and they weren't ever found guilty necessarily of that crime, but if somebody did a, a record check and found out that they were found guilty or, or, or charged with, um, uh, you know, uh, well, say it was a violent crime, you know, kind of thing, charged with, with some uh, shoplifting, they're charged with fraud, they were charged with, you know, something that, that a business might not want that type of person to be employed. Um, that would scare them off, even if though they weren't found guilty of that charge. So that also fell under clean slate with uh, the ability to take a look at the, the non-convictions um, and, and make sure that they were automatically um, sealed and, and had that. Um, taken off of the record. But the ability for us to continue working, and we had a lot of great partners, as I mentioned, you know, Jordan Harris is my partner within the, the state house, and um, he's a Democrat from Philadelphia. Uh, we've been termed the odd couple of Pennsylvania, you know, because we are so different. And in, in, um, I joke and say I'm a, a white woman from central Pennsylvania. He's a black man from Philadelphia. Um, uh, we uh, make up the uh, ability to, to recognize that we're from very, very different um, uh, parts of the, of the state. But we work well together on this issue. And, and it's interesting as to the fact of when we have the debates as to where we can go with Clean Slate, we're both very proud of, of what we've done with Clean Slate um, and the uh, um, you know, millions of people that we've been able to help 
with that law. And, and I would just to say, I appreciate the ability for, for folks to recognize what, what we have done um, in the sense that very rarely, I think, in, in your job, do you get to uh, feel, especially even as, as was mentioned earlier, I think um, David was talking about the fact of you, you don't see the benefit right away. Um, and, and in the legislature, when you try to pass a bill, um, you know you're going to have the impact because you wouldn't have started it if you didn't think that there was an issue to be fixed. Um, but the, it's very gratifying to be able to, to work on a public policy um, that, that you know um, within one year has had an impact on millions of people um, within the Commonwealth. And, and that's something that I think any state can get to. Um, I think you'll see different versions, obviously, um, and, and all of us will have to abide by what, what our state can tolerate. Um, our state right now is as a very, um, it's Republican in, in the in the state legislature, both on both sides, but we have a, a Democrat governor. Um, and and um, let's just say we don't agree very often. Um, and uh, so to find uh, something that we, uh, again, it's, it's not the politics, it's, it's the policy that we need to, to do for, uh, for all of the states. So I think every state can get that to that point. If Pennsylvania can get there, I think any other state can get there. Um, but the ability is really just finding that, that happy medium because they're not gonna agree on, on all the issues. You know, we, we still are talking about a lot of different things that we can do, um, whether it's probation um, and continuing the pendulum swing, you know, to make some of those changes. Um, and also like going back with four, uh, 440 um, with fines and fees to, to tweak what has already been put into place and, and help people. Um, but we know we can help some more people if we make a, a few changes with, with, um, with the law that's in place. So um, mm -hmm. I hope that kind of covers, you know, the, the, the gamut um, because we've got some good things happening. And I think that um, we're looking to other states as well to see where um, we have our JRI one. I, I know the reinvestment was talked about. We had JRI one and we just passed JRI two. Um, as well. So that's also something that the DAs are heavily involved in um, and, and their expertise in, in, in how they do their job on a daily basis. It's, it, we couldn't do it without, you know, that input in the probation officers and parole officers and that kind of thing. And, and as well, you know, some of the conversation also comes back to, I talk to a lot of COs in our prisons um, and, and what they see and what they see that people, you know, once they get there, you know, some, some as was mentioned, need to stay there. Um, but the ones that are coming out, uh, which most of them are, um, the ones that are coming out back into our society, you know, talking to the COs and the ones that see them every day um, when they're in, in jail and, or in prison, um, is, is they have a lot of input as well and a lot of good um, resource uh, to, to be able to understand what's really happening in our system. Thank you. And thank you all so much. I know we've, uh, we could talk about this for days, hours, quite frankly, the rest of, you know, COVID isolation if need be. But um, with that being said, thank you guys all so much. Thank you for, for thank all you. of the hosts and, and um, Josh for keeping me in line with questions. Um, anybody else has anything left? I think that'll be it. Yep, thank just you. want to say thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And don't let COVID discourage this legislation. Everybody needs to lean into this. This is really important. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We all need champions like y'all. Thank, thank you. you yep. Take care. Take care.